Oscar Woodward, who is uh, the head of epidemiology and biostatistics at the University of Auckland, and Jürgen Gerlach, who is the head of the department for road traffic planning and engineering at the University of Wuppertal in Germany. And throughout this presentation, what I've done is I've actually introduced some hypotheses. And the first one is probably not that controversial. The faster you go, the bigger the mess. This has actually been around for just over 20 years. The first Edward screened one week ago, 20 years ago. What I would say is this applies not just in rural areas, but also in urban areas. And that was emphasized by Christine Jeff, who uh, produced one of the uh, road safety videos, Spot the Difference, for the uh, Land Transport Safety Authority. Stop. <laughs> Please stop. No way you're going to keep going. I can't. Hey. <laughs> See you. See you. Don't pick her up, don't pick her up. I, I, I don't know what to oh, do. Is she breathing? I don't know. I don't... <laughs> My baby breathed. Look what you've done. It's uh, not just about sticking to the speed limit though. Um, as uh, you can see in the uh, uh, guidance, in the equation, in the economic evaluation manual, the equation is for linear interpolation of speed. And it's not, not just about crash costs that increase the speed, but also the likelihood of a crash happening in the first instance. And the probability of a road user suffering injury or death is shown in the diagram on the bottom right, which was developed by Hamish Mackey, who we just heard about in the next presentation. That uh, speed is related uh, to crash outcomes isn't just the, uh, traffic engineering theory, as we've done field trials on this, if you so wish, because we've changed the uh, open road speed limit twice in. Uh, New Zealand's recent history. First in 1973, the open speed limit was reduced from um, 88 kilometers per hour, so 55 miles per hour, to uh, 80 kilometers per hour. And at the time, that was largely a result of a, uh, as a fuel conservation measure. And then in 1985, we increased the open road speed limit from 80 to 100, <coughs> partly to reflect that the prevailing operating speeds had over the last few years gone up. And you can see those events in this graph that uh, shows fatalities and injuries in New Zealand uh, quite clearly. The first change in 1973 coincides exactly with um, the um, highest number of people that died on the roads. It goes down and then it starts creeping up again, as I say, in line with the uh, prevailing operating speeds increasing until the government then said, oh well, we put the speed limit up by 20 k's an hour and after that it shot really up uh, before it started coming down again. There were, of course, all sorts of other measures being done at the same time it also influenced the shape of this graph. But the underlying work that uh, Glenn Curry and Bill Frith have done on this, that you can read up on this research paper, is really interesting and uh, uh, quite eye-opening. So the faster you go, the bigger the mess. Are you all happy with that hypothesis? My second hypothesis is probably quite controversial. Our safe systems thinking is confused. 
Be with me while I explain. Transport systems traditionally um, were designed around maximizing capacity and mobility, and little attention was given to safety in the field. And that was true internationally, and New Zealand certainly wasn't an exception on that front, but over time the focus has changed and the work we now do in New Zealand is influenced by the safe systems thinking. So the current road safety strategy that we have in place is Safer Journeys 2010-2020, and timelines we are most of the way through. And the quote um, from Safer Journeys that is quite uh, striking is, and that really sums it up what's going on, we need to improve the safety of all parts of the system. Roads and roadsides, speeds, vehicles, and road use. So that if one part fails, other parts will still protect the people involved. And there are four parts to our safe systems approach, and on three of them we are actually doing quite well. And I suggest that we haven't really made tangible inroads on safe speeds as a nation. And speeds is something that we can influence as engineers and planners in a variety of ways. You know, we set speed limits, we design different speed environments. We can change the form of intersection control and how we design an intersection, that in itself will also influence how fast people travel. Um, by way of example, the photo um, on the right shows uh, a couple of offset T intersections. Traffic signals are proposed uh, in this location. So when speeds go down, road safety will improve. I think that's um, um, quite a logical conclusion of, um, in all of this. But that brings me to the crux of the matter. Our economic evaluation procedures discourage us from slowing people down because we balance safety and economic efficiency. Travel time is valued quite highly. Saving crashes is counted as a benefit. Delaying drivers is counted as a disbenefit. And the benefits and disbenefits may cancel each other. And in case you don't believe me, and you know, maybe you've never been anywhere near economic evaluation, here's an example. Um, there are some values from the economic evaluation manual. Um, uh, there are certain values assumed for fatality, for serious injury, and we um, take values into account for travel time as well. So let's just assume we have a project where there's 20,000 vehicles a day that our road safety measure makes them experience 12 seconds um, of per vehicle of delay. And for economic evaluation uh, processes, you assume those delays occurring 300 days a year. How long will it be before Travel time this benefits equal crash benefits. For serious injury, it takes just under one and a half years, and for fatality, it takes just over 14 years. So, in other words, it is more economically justifiable to have someone killed every 14 years or someone had hospitalized every one and a half years, then to delay 20,000 drivers per day by more than 12 seconds. Wow. Well, let's just regurgitate that. It is more economically justifiable to have someone killed every 14 years than to delay 20,000 drivers per day by more than 12 seconds. What is it going to do with those 12 seconds? I've tried to think of a good adjective to describe this situation. Quite a few came to mind. 
what seemed to fit best is described in the Oxford Dictionary like so. Not morally correct. And that's the definition for unethical. What does this all mean? A road controlling authority working on a road safety project may not uh, receive subsidy if there is a big enough delay component in the work that they want to do. So the options then are either the project doesn't get done or the project is 100% funded by the ratepayer. And an example of that would generally be when you first want to install traffic signals because by holding up the main road traffic for the first time you to be so much delay that it is not impossible to get uh, past you know the safety benefits outweighing the, the delay costs. And there are workarounds that the government has put in place or the people who look after the EEM um, you know, uh, for example, minor road safety projects, you know, um, you don't have to do any economic uh, evaluation. Um, if you stick below a cap, um, you can just spend the money on anything. And the cap for minor safety used to be uh, 75 Ks. At the moment, it's at 300 Ks. And next financial year, it's going up to a million. But the question remains for me, is there possibly something that we should be fundamentally changing? So I had a chat with Jürgen Gellert, um, who uh, had put this together, and asked him, what's the German approach to road safety? How do you do your road safety projects? And found that there's a lot of similarities to what we do in New Zealand. So, for example, they've always had a ranking process that identifies the projects, um, those that make most, most sense, they get done first, and um, so they have a nice list, and. Uh, They've been doing this forever, and so their crash numbers have been declining since 1970, so they started declining just a tad earlier than what we've achieved in, uh, in New Zealand. But there's a few differences as well. And uh, amongst those, what I found interesting was they have a commission that's responsible for crash reduction, and that's made up of two public bodies and the police. So it's a... Uh, a group of people making uh, decisions, they make recommendations, and those recommendations are binding. You must, as the World Controlling Authority, you must implement those safety measures. <coughs> but what really struck me is, below, you know, from a hierarchy point of view, uh, what is the equivalent here of a state highway over there, below that hierarchy, travel time is not one of the considerations for their own, in their road safety program. They just don't take road travel time into consideration. Well, I thought, that's interesting. So if, uh, I've graphed the uh, performance, uh, the safety performance of New Zealand uh, compared that to uh, uh, Germany, and so the blue line, that is the number of deaths on the road in New Zealand that you've seen in one of the earlier slides, uh, based on Glenn's work. This goes a bit uh, further back, a few decades. And the, um, the bar chart that is um, deaths based on a per 100,000 population. So the orange is the New Zealand data and Germany is the green data. And you can see that uh, up to about um, 1970, our um, uh, safety performance in Germany, safety performance was pretty much in line and then uh, from uh, 19, during the 1970s um, we both more or less uh, went down uh, and performed better at the same rate but something changed in 1980 you know where they kept going down we went back up again that's when the rural speeds started creeping up and then there's the split on the German data in 1991, that's the German reunification, uh, where mm -hmm. the East Germans had a much higher route for the West Germans on a population basis. But where it's basically now is uh, recall 6.9 people per 100,000 population on our roads in New Zealand, and the Germans, their rate is just over half that, so they're doing a lot better. But what's also worrying is that uh, 
um, with NOR law in 2013 at 253 deaths on the road and since then we've been going up at quite some rate and that's not something that happens over there. So I would say that the economic efficiency considerations have an impact on road safety. We have failed to make inroads with speed as part of our safer journeys road safety strategy. The economic evaluation procedures want us to do the opposite from what's safe, you know, it asks us to minimize delay, um, whilst it should um, ask us to reduce really speed. And we have fundamentally different approaches to uh, travel delay in New Zealand compared to Germany. I'd su suggest it prevents us from improving safety, and we certainly can't, we can't both be right, you know. One of us has got it wrong, and I think it's probably us. Which is why I put the hypothesis forward, our safe systems thinking is confused. Do you agree with me? Which brings me to my third and last hypothesis. And I, I admit that it's difficult to see, but I would suggest efficiency considerations embed themselves in design guidelines. <clears throat> that design guidelines in different countries want you to do different things with different safety outcomes is not easy to spot, with the exception maybe of roundabout guides. And in a German roundabout, it's like coming to a T-intersection, you know, you come to, a, to the roundabout and it's like, you, you, you turn into it. It's a deliberate turn into it. So the emphasis there is on minimizing speed and thus maximizing safety. And that's actually the same in other continental European countries. The same principle applies in urban as well as in rural areas. In New Zealand, we have, beyond some minimum def deflection, the emphasis is on minimizing delay. I'll show you a, a video here that I took in France the other year. It's a 90k four-lane uh, really divided road, merged to a single lane, dropped the speed from the prior to the roundabout. It's a relatively slow negotiation speed. After the roundabout, the speed limit goes up again, back to 90, and the road widens back to the lanes. Quite different to uh, a roundabout, a uh, rural roundabout in New Zealand, I would suggest. So what we do know is, of course, that the prevalence of cycling in Germany is very different to that in New Zealand. But let's take the number of injury crashes at signalized intersections to be the base case for each country. In Germany, the number of injury crashes at roundabouts involving cyclists is 2.1 times that at traffic signals. The New Zealand equivalent is 4.9 times as many cycle crashes as roundabouts compared to traffic signals. Now something is going on for such a difference to occur. Either we build our signalized intersections much safer, safer than the Germans do, or German roundabout design is fundamentally safer than what we seem to be able to achieve in New Zealand. And unfortunately, it's probably the latter. Minimizing delay and saving people time is the unspoken objective in our roundabout guidelines. It's the underlying cause for the crash differences that I showed you on the previous slide. I've done um, work for, uh, research work for Ostrolds on um, roundabout design issues and um, I can tell you that it is not easy to challenge 
those underlying unspoken objectives. And one of the things that I learned from working for Ostrods um, on this is, is that we should first agree on the underlying principles and then um, if we all agree that it is a good idea that we change our design approach to roundabouts, then it is a lot going to be a lot easier if we, as a country, go ahead and write our own roundabout design guidelines rather than try and convince Ostrods to do this. So that's how I have come up with the hypothesis that efficiency considerations embed themselves in design guidelines. And I don't know whether you um, concur with me. So I come to the uh, recommendations. And firstly, I would suggest that we remove thermal time consideration from road safety project evaluation. I would be um, quite open to maybe exclude state highways from this. But secondly, we do this as part of a focus on safe speeds as part of our road safety 2010 to 2020 strategy. The reason why this is important and urgent is on the right. We had our best year in terms of deaths on the road in 2013, where we lost 253 people. Last year, we had 328 people killed on our roads. As of earlier today, there have been 332 deaths in New Zealand on the roads this year. That is almost exactly one death per day. So by the end of the year, we have a good chance of ending up with 365 deaths per annum, which is exactly where we were in 2008. No progress in nine years. Not good enough. Mm. So that was the presentation that I gave uh, to the Cycle Congress. Um, here's a little postscript. Uh, the road safety director of the transport agency uh, spotted this tweet the other day. Uh, he's been quoted, um, we've got to stop trading off safety for time savings and our death toll is completely unacceptable. We need to create a sense of outrage and urgency in the public. So he appears to agree with me. Thank you. I've got a question. <laughs> um, how do our car ownership numbers um, compare with Germany, like trending wise? Is it going up or down in terms of maybe public transport or our, our car ownership here in New Zealand is yes. much much higher we don't think we're and is it trending highest. up compared uh, to Germany like is it both yeah. trending up or no. up and down no. so would that have an impact on this um, it, it, it will have yes yeah. I mean and that's I guess that's that's another um, it's, it's worth another yeah, presentation yeah. Um, one of the things um, that in road safety circles hasn't, isn't really under discussion is one way of getting yeah. um, the rates come down is for people yeah. to drive less, less drivers. for there to be less freight on the roads. We, yeah. We're not even having that discussion. And the other question I had was how does it compare to um, inexperienced drivers? Like in New Zealand there's a, lo a lot of younger drivers, I think we get our licenses here early, and there's a lot of tourist oh, yes. drivers. Yes. How does that compare to Germany? Yes, um, good, good question. Has definitely a lot to do with it. Um, yeah. We all know that young males are a very high risk group, um, and they their crash rate is a lot higher yeah. than the equivalent females. Or yeah. and, once, and once to they... inexperienced tourist drivers. Yeah, it's, I don't know. it's. Um, Driving in in the wrong absolute side of numbers, road. it doesn't actually um, show up quite as as badly. 
this is being given a lot of focus by the media, yeah. um, but the actual problem isn't quite as high okay. as you would yeah. um, sense from, from follow, following the media. Now, uh, many years ago, we had an initiative, and that is what most countries do, um, you know, um, if you recognize that there are high risk groups, yeah. then you make it um, a little bit harder for them to drive uh, in the first instance or to drive high powered vehicles. And an easy tool um, to do so is um, to have compulsory third party insurance. Yes. The last government just flatly rejected uh, that, whereas all other, almost all other countries um, that have a much better safety record than we have. Really? They use this as a as a policy tool because that is how you price high risk drivers out of the market, or at least you keep yeah. them away from the really um, high powered vehicles. Why? Why did they say no to that? I don't because understand. the insurance council mm -hmm. told them that that uh, wasn't in their interest of having to insure um, high risk drivers. Oh. That that is what that is what. Um, that was when Stephen Joyce was transport yeah. minister. I, I was there. I had a discussion with him, right. with his MOT advisor, and it was it was astonishing. That astonishing. seems crazy to have it everywhere in the world. Yeah. <laughs> I have hope that things will change. <laughs> so, Axel, does Germany have national road casualty reduction targets? I don't know, to be honest. Because. When I first arrived in New Zealand in 2007, one year after that, the Labour government published a national transportation strategy yeah. and introduced for the first time a raft of national targets yeah. for transportation, including, I think for the first time, national casualty reduction targets, which we've been used to for 15, 20 years in the UK. And that was how the UK government drove performance from local authorities because they didn't have a slavish acquisition and adherence to cost-benefit analyses. Your main way of getting money out of the UK government for road safety was to tell them what you were doing to deliver locally the national casualty reduction targets. And if you move to that point, then actually you can still take account of cost-benefit analyses within schemes, but you are demonstrating what you're doing about reducing casualties over a period of time. And the government can drive better performance from individual local authorities and from its own highways and operations branch within the transport agency as well. And all those so, targets went into 2008, yes. if you remember. Yeah. Yes, they did. And I was just astonished yes. that, um, that they were removed. Because, yeah. um, because it just make, it still makes no sense to me whatsoever why, if, if we've got an objective we want to achieve, why are we so frightened about having a target? The so French were really clever. Mm -hmm. In the 2000 road safety strategy, we had targets for 2010, and we didn't quite meet them. We met them the year after, actually. Um, but it was interesting, I think, rolled 2010 and the new road safety strategy, and they didn't have any targets. We just yeah. had you know, increasingly free of death and serious injuries. Well, yeah. you only have to go down one and yeah. you get that. So. Like you know, that. The, the, the French were quite, quite clever. The, it's, at one point, they had a system in place whereby you know, they, they subsidize uh, the local authorities as well, just as we do. And they said, right, so each local authority had their own specific fatality targets, and if you met them, yeah, yep. uh, you would continue to get your subsidy, not for road safety work, for everything that mm. was being subsidized yeah. in, the, in the routing world. And if you did meet those targets, your subsidy was being scaled back. And it was hurting <laughs> real badly if you didn't. Mm. That sharpened the focus. Mm. Mm. They made good inroads. Mm. It's money rules. Yeah. Worked. Brilliant.